Like I mentioned in the last video, it's hard to know where to start any historical narrative. I chose to start the web's history in the 60s because there was a set of ideas in the air at the time, which would be key to how the web works, but also very much in line with how artists work. And this series is about that intersection, the web and art. But another series could have started the web's story somewhere else. For example, most web history essays and books begin the story in the 1940s with a hugely influential Atlantic magazine article called As We May Think, written by an American scientist and engineer named Vannevar Bush. In it, he describes how strange it was that while we think one way, we usually organize information another. Bush was writing the article right at the end of World War II, and in it he was calling scientists and engineers who had been working on the war effort to apply their new technologies and skills towards solving the information problem, in particular the way we interact with our information. In the article, he describes an imaginary machine he calls the Memex, in which, quote, an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. The Memex would store all this material on microfilm, which was a popular technology at the time, which would make it possible to fit an entire library in a single desk. But unlike a library, the Memex would allow you to embed associative connections between documents. Links. Say you're looking for a particular adventure novel. In a library, you walk up to the fiction floor, then over to the adventure section. Say there you picked up a novel and started reading it. And in it, a protagonist uses a particular kind of bow and arrow, and you'd like to learn more about this bow and arrow. Well, you're in luck, because you're in a library. But unfortunately, you've got to leave the adventure section, walk up one flight of stairs, and over into another section before you can read about bow and arrows. That's because we used to, for example in libraries, organize information categorically, alphabetically, and numerically. We'd index information this way in order to ensure that we could find it later when we needed it. But that's not the way we organize our thoughts. We don't think in alphabetical order, we think in terms of associations. And so the memics would be different from the library and take some cues in the way that we think. First of all, you don't have to go anywhere. It's all inside that one desk. There you could pull up the adventure book on one panel, and then you could pull up the bow and arrow book on another. Then you could leave marginal notes right into the machine, and the best part, you could create a link between these two texts, so that the next time someone else opened up the adventure book, if they wanted to know more about bow and arrows, they could follow that link that you left, and vice versa, someone reading the article on bow and arrows could follow the link back to the adventure book. It would be an entirely different way of interacting with information. Selection by association rather than indexing. Quote, wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear, ready-made with a mesh of associative trails running through them, ready to be dropped into the memics and there amplified. So this is kind of like a sort of proto-steampunk Wikipedia box thing. So, hope you found some interesting and inspirational ideas in this short aside about Vannevar Bush. Specifically, don't forget what I said at the beginning of this video. Where one chooses to begin any particular history is always bias. There never really is a clean or clear beginning to anything. Lots of artists like to claim firsties right on things, but nothing ever truly is first. For example, I started the web story in the 60s, but explained how most start it in the 40s, and if you ask Vincent Cerf, co-author of TCPIP, the internet's fundamental protocol, he'd tell you that the idea of the internet was born in Belgium, and specifically some of the ideas we associate with the web. Because a decade before Vannevar Bush published that paper, a Belgian librarian named Paul Otlet envisioned many of the same things, albeit with a different technological approach. And if we research hard enough, we could likely trace the web's history even further back. As artists, we study history to understand how things came to be, to effectively contextualize the work we're doing in the present, and to find inspiration for what we should do in the future. With this in mind, history is most useful to us if we reject clean, linear, myopic narratives and embrace the honest diversity of history. The only reason we typically learn and thus understand history in this sort of clean, linear way is because we didn't have the web growing up. By which I mean that the technology we used to do history, paper books and essays, came with constraints, which forced us to tell and subsequently understand history in a limited, linear way. This is what McLuhan is trying to explain when he says the medium is the message, or we shape our tools, thereafter our tools shape us. This is one example of how they shape us. The limitations and or bias of the technology we use to tell history has also informed our understanding of it. It's informed the way that we think about it. Now I think this is changing and will continue to change as we use new nonlinear technologies like the web to retell history. It's like Ted Nelson explains in his demo of Xanadu. Consider the writing of history. What is history? It's many parallel streams of events which meet at certain points. So why not create them as parallel structures? That makes it easier to write, easier to read.